can't see it Okay, it's 5.30. We'll call the Finance Subcommittee meeting to order. Um, if the clerk could please call the roll. Scott. Here. Here. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we have two items on the agenda this evening. Actually, we'll start off with this. Quite a few members from the city here, if everyone could just introduce themselves. Um, so we have two items on the agenda this evening. The first item is emergency expenditure authorization for the Wad main break. Um, we'll start with that item. Um, if C CFO Baldwin, if you do you have presentation information for this? Yes, Madam Chair. If you could start with that, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to the members of the subcommittee, good evening. Uh, my name is Connor Baldwin. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. With me is uh, Deputy CFO Austin Ball. Uh, as well as a number of the department heads um, from relevant departments. What we're going to be talking about here first on the agenda is uh, related to a vote that was proposed to the City Council um, regarding emergency expenditure authorization for a water main break which occurred on or about 11 2022. Um, so a little bit of background, uh, emergency expenditure authorization uh, is provided for under the general laws of the Mass of Massachusetts, Chapter 44, Subsection 31. Uh, by vote of the local legislative body, departments can spend in excess of appropriations. It is something that is otherwise is explicitly prohibited. Um, so after the water main break, which occurred uh, in November, the Director of Accounts reached out to uh, myself and suggested this as a as uh, something that the city should avail itself of. Um, she had seen on the news the water main break that had happened and was very concerned um, both for the community as well as for the city's finances. The, de the finance department and the city manager's office maintains a very close relationship with the Department of Revenue. So this was a suggestion um, that she put forward and, and something that we then brought forward to the council um, for authorization. So. What this does, it provides immediate spending authority until other financing sources become available. It is meant um, for these specific types of emergencies. Uh, an emergency is defined under the statute as a major disaster, including but not limited to floods, drought, fire, hurricanes, earthquakes, storms, or other catastrophes, whether natural or otherwise, uh, which pose an immediate threat to the health and safety of persons or property. So what occurred in November fit the bill. Uh, this, um, this exercise or this vote is something that prior to 2018 was a regular occurrence with the City Council because the Council had to take this vote in order to allow the uh, administration to spend in excess of appropriations for snow and ice. So in 2018, when the, le the, the general court passed uh, what's known as municipal modernization, it took away uh, the requirement for legislative approval. So now, uh, under the current state of the law, it, it only requires a letter from the chief executive to the town accountant or city auditor, in our case, um, in order for us to deficit spend for snow and ice. However, all of the other categories maintain that legislate uh, the need for legislative approval. And that is what we're seeking. Um, other uh, types of emergencies where something like this has come up 
for the city of Lowell uh, is with snow and ice, as I mentioned, the most notable being in 2015 for what was referred to then as Winter Storm Juno. Um, that, was, as many of us will recall, uh, the city of Lowell received a, a lot of snow that year. And so there was special legislation later that was passed that allowed us to amortize that deficit over a three year period. Uh, normally, in most cases, uh, you must raise it in the next year. And typically the way that we do that would be we would build it into the budget for the subsequent fiscal year, and then we would raise it on the tax rate recap. Um, so uh, the types of expenditures that have been incurred thus far are, and all of the uh, relevant department heads are here to discuss them in detail if there are any questions, for water, fire, police, uh, DPW, Health and Human Services, which um, includes the Council on Aging. Uh, and the amounts are listed here. Uh, not listed in this table, though, are for the Health Department and Council on Aging. There was overtime in the amounts of 3700 and 1500 So the revised total of what has been spent to date is 63000 What is not listed here, um, but are also likely expenditures and would be a subsequent phase of dealing with the emergency would be any claims that would be made upon the city. And um, the f acting first assistant city solicitor, uh, Mr. McKenna, is here um, if there are any questions in that regard. So that is uh, a brief description of the, the rationale and the purpose for putting this vote forward. If the council does not um, vote to authorize the city to spend in excess of appropriations, then we'll need to use existing appropriations to cover all of these um, expenditures, including any claims, and that is, um, that is the whole of the presentation on this matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Janess is now present also. Uh, does anyone have any comments that would like to speak on this agenda item, or is everyone here for parking? No, no items. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Councilor Gitchia. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Um, I looked at the Munis report from um, just last week, and I thank Auditor Oates for putting this online so it's easier to read. And as we look through the fire department, we obviously have had an issue with the overtime, but I do believe there's funds in their permanent uh, salaries that can cover this. So I, I don't think that this is outside the realm of keeping people within their current budget. And I also looked at the water departments and wastewater in the same thing. The water department, actually, when you look at their salaries, their salaries line, they're at 33% spent this year, and we're at over 40% already gone so there, there is money in that account that can offset the overtime and, and uh, through you madam chair to the uh, director or to uh, the CFO wouldn't it be wise to stay within those lines for now and because my whole point to this whole thing is when we look at snow and ice that's a city's responsibility not a city city's liability so we're crossing the line here of trying to create funding for liabilities versus responsibilities. We had no responsibility in this except the, to pay the overtime costs, which that's what you hear before us now. But we talk about claims going to the city solicitor's office. We never appropriate money before the claim comes in, and it's actually a liability that's actually due that we, we pay that off. Um, so I don't think that this is a good precedent to set on the way we're spending money, especially at this time when everybody's salaries and wages are under the percentage. I do understand in the beginning when you start seeing this right away, let's get this through as uh, the state suggested, but after reviewing the numbers, it seems as though it would fit within all of the accounts that are before us within this salaries permit. Um, I, I, I would defer it to you on that question to the uh, director of of the water department and also to aaron fox at wastewater if you look at your salaries obviously you have vacancies that's creating a surplus in those accounts that could cover this um, and when we look at the contracted services i think there's a bigger issue there than what, what's being presented tonight um, i think that the issue with the contracted services is we're seeing is that we have employees that don't want to come in for overtime 
and they're not answering their phones. So, and, and we've said this for months. I've said it since I started on this board that um, we need to hold a tough line towards our own employees and make sure that they start showing up to these things. And if they don't want to show up and we're showing negative revenues in that enterprise account, we should just lay off. I don't need you. I need you to save the city money. That's the reason why we have the purpose of employees. If I keep contracting out these other breaks, then I don't have the funds. I'm paying out of two funds to do something that I actually have employees to do that job for. But they're taking the road of they don't want to come in. So if you answer your phone, when, when we interviewed people for these jobs, a very simple question is always asked to the employee, are you willing to work overtime? I've never had anybody in the history of being a management person who has said to me no, or I wouldn't hire them. That's part of their jobs. Everybody knows that. And water main breaks, uh, it's a tough, tough industry. It's a tough job. But if we're hiring you for a function, it's not just an eight to four function. Now they move the time so that they can be there when they want it to be there from seven to three job. It requires, the residents require people to work outside those normal hours. But somehow the union in these employees think they have the power over this. So I'm paying you benefits, Blue Cross Blue Shield, G, uh, G, GIC benefits for an employee who's going to work outside the normal hours, but for some reason they just don't want to come in and we have to call contractors in at prevailing wage and everything else that goes in. So I think we live within our means that we have here, Connor, and as we dive into the end of the fiscal year, if we come to these problems, then we, we come back and, and we make appropriations to, to move funds. That's just my opinion. Thank you. CFO Baldwin, do you have any input at all as far as um, it, the need to do an emergency expenditure versus taking it from the line items of the budget? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I. I don't disagree in any way with uh, the comments of uh, Councillor Gitch here. Um, this is a <clears throat> this vote allows us to record all of the expenditures together. Um, it, it is certainly true that the water department has um, not has spent below its budget so far this year in both overtime and salary and wages permanent. Um, so. Uh, we don't necessarily have a strong recommendation one way or the other. It was a, a recommendation to us from the Department of Revenue. Um, at the time, I, I think we were under the impression that these initial expenditures would be much greater. Um, you know, what it does though is, or what it would do, or what it, it would give us the opportunity to do uh, is to not have to use the budget which had been planned and budgeted for a number of other things for what was an emergency and an unforeseen circumstance. So we are fine from the finance department with whatever the finance subcommittee recommends and the, the council as a whole decides. I'm sure we can, uh, we can manage in either regard. But uh, our recommendation is to take advantage of this opportunity because it's available to us. Um, it allows us to plan this expenditure and build it into next year's budget and to use that overtime funds, those overtime funds rather, for other special projects that may have been needed, um, and if there's any unspent salaries for those to uh, come back to, if it's the water fund, the, uh, the retained earnings. But like I said, um, you know, the will of the body here is, is how we will proceed. Council Robinson, do you have anything to add at all? So this 57.8, that's right, Councillor, with the slight revision that we discussed for health and council on aging. So we're at about $63,000 expended uh, in support of the, um, the water main break. That's right. These expenditures here are only for 
city employees, with the exception of the food uh, that was purchased in the, the senior center it's, it's for, and the outside contractors, but these were all uh, city employee um, salary and wages. Do you have a general ballpark of what you'd be looking for for a preliminary budget to start of this, to start the response that we need? Instead of like uh, going for this, this money we're going to draw down and, and we don't know what the numbers look like, do you have a figure in mind to get started at least? Sure, I, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, if we were to put some kind of framework around what we've spent to date, the, the number is 63,000, um, as to the next phase, you know, and maybe this is what, what I'll refer to as mitigation and remediation, um, but any, any type of um, subsequent claims that are brought, et cetera, I, I don't know that I could put a number to that, or I would certainly defer to the, uh, the solicitor on that matter. Okay, thank oh, sorry. You. Um, CFO Baldwin, if, just so that I understand correct, is there any, um, I guess, any urgency or reason for doing this right now at this time where this, there hasn't been any claims brought forward? There, you know, these amounts can be handled within the line items of the budget. Is there anything like timely reason that we have to take action on this right now? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The timeliness is in relation to the event. I think the urgency is only to take action on this matter if we intend to approve it before June 30th. Uh, and so it is not out of the question to revisit this issue down the line. Um, and, and I think I'll, def well, Kelly, just tell me if I'm wrong here, but you know, if it becomes a problem with those departmental appropriations in May, and, and the council were to come back and approve this vote, we could expenditure transfer um, those expenditures, which we have an accounting of now, uh, into a special revenue fund. What, what this vote technically allows us to do is create a special revenue fund related to the emergency and record all expenditures associated with the event in a special revenue fund. And we would close that out in the subsequent fiscal year either by making appropriations for it in the FY 2024 budget, um, or if there's free cash, we could ask the council for an appropriation from free cash into the special revenue fund, or if there are other available funds identified at the end of the year, we could seek an appropriation from the council to close out um, the expenditures. Thank you. Council get you. I'd like to make a motion to not support the emergency expenditure authorization at this time. Second. All, all, roll call. Council Scott. Yes. Council Gitchy. Yes. Council Robinson. Yes. Three yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we, we first, before we, before we go, um, I'd just like to thank all of the department heads for all their hard work during this uh, emergency event. It, it takes a lot of coordination to get this done, whether it's the water department, wastewater, or DPW, you talked about the senior center, um, it, it, the animal uh, control, the police, the fire, and especially, you know, when you look at the financial pieces and everything, I just want to thank everyone who came tonight in the health department for everything they do for us. Thank you.
<clears throat> we'll move on to our second item on the agenda, which is the presentation around the parking enterprise fund. Um, I guess we can do the presentation first. I don't know if the public would rather wait to speak after the presentation, I assume. So, CFO Baldwin, if you could please. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and we'll be uh, brief, as, as brief as possible. So a little bit of background on the Parking Enterprise Fund and the rules um, and the statutes that govern the accounting of enterprise funds in Massachusetts. Uh, so an enterprise fund uh, is governed by Chapter 44, Section 53F and a half, uh, and has a number of rules and regulations that have been promulgated by the Department of Revenue as to how its operations. At, it, at its base, uh, an enterprise fund is meant to uh, demonstrate to a community the true cost of a utility or uh, certain recreational uh, activities or another type of operation. And so in Lowell for many years, uh, we've operated the parking enterprise, the, the parking operation as an enterprise fund. Uh, so over the course of the last several years with um, COVID being a notable uh, acceleration, the city has seen a significant decrease in the fund balance uh, of the parking enterprise fund. So one note I will make about enterprise funds is at the end of the year, if there is a surplus, uh, that surplus will remain with the fund. It is not like other departments in the city where if they don't spend all of their departmental appropriation, it then comes back to the general fund. Um, so the city operates the parking, parking operation, the water utility, and the sewer, sewer utility as enterprise funds. And the, as, as I, I think I mentioned, the intent is to set the rates commensurate with the total cost of the operation. And so our parking enterprise, just like water and sewer, it accounts for the salary and wages of the parking department, the city personnel, all expenditures related to parking, and that includes our contract with LAS, who is the, um, the, the contractor we have to manage the garages. It also accounts for the debt service um, for all of the garages, whether it's uh, constructions, construction bonds that were issued to construct the garages or for repair bonds that may have been issued uh, to uh, fund various repair projects at the garages, uh, as well as the kiosks uh, or other departmental equipment. All of the debt service is accounted for in the enterprise fund. There is also an indirect charge uh, to the general fund for any services that are provided by other city departments in support of the enterprise fund. So. As I mentioned, the, the parking enterprise has seen a significant decrease in the fund balance. Uh, that fund balance is, carries forward year to year in an enterprise fund. Um, this is driven in part due to a reduction in revenue, which a lot of, uh, a lot of that we can attribute to COVID, which uh, declined the fund balance, but also to an increase in expenditures. So these Increased expenditures have to do with the debt service for the construction of the Hamilton Canal Garage, and we'll go into this in a f some further detail in a minute. Um, the bottom line is that the city's current rate structure is insufficient to meet those expenditures moving forward. Now, enterprise funds do not have to, by law, support themselves. There are many communities um, throughout Massachusetts where a subsidy of an enterprise fund is an annual occurrence. This happens in a lot of towns with recreational activities, et cetera. But in Lowell, historically, and certainly as long as I've been here, um, you know, it has been an objective to balance enterprise funds and to bring rate increases to keep them self-supporting. Mr. Ball? So what's on the screen and is probably difficult for most of the people in the audience to see is a forecast um, over the next five years. This is something that we maintain, publish in the budget, um, and update uh, regularly of the, all of the revenues um, for the year, all of the expenditures. And just, so, uh, just as I mentioned, you, you can see how at the, the bottom of the top, the, uh, the revenues for 2023, our revised estimate is $7.2 million. Now that includes uh, the on-street parking meter revenue, as well as the revenue for all of the garages. Uh, surface lots, um, the garages, the Roy garage, the lower locks, early garage, etc., um, a as well as any other ancillary revenue. Um, enterprise funds, we keep them in separate bank accounts so they earn interest on the fund balance. That interest belongs to the enterprise fund. Uh, so on the expenditure side of the ledger, 
you see all of those categories I, I mentioned, salary and wages. Uh, there's an assessment for pensions for the uh, employees of the enterprise, health care, et cetera, and then the debt service. So our debt service existing debt service schedule is in the neighborhood of uh, four and a half to five million dollars annually. We'll get into that detail in a minute. Um, there are two newer uh, loan orders that have been approved. One is for uh, repair bonds for the, um, uh, the Ayotte garage and the Downs John Street garage, uh, as well as the purchase of new kiosks. Um, and so we have incorporated the debt service into the forecast, although that debt service the f uh, will start to come online next year and moving forward. We'll get into that uh, in more detail in a minute. So all in all, the expenditures are um, at about $10 million, but will increase over time up to about $12 million. And so the, the annual operating loss of the enterprise fund is to the tune of 2 to $3 million and, and will grow over time if no revenue um, enhancements are sought. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some additional detail on the debt for the enterprise fund. In this schedule here, there are 11 different debt issuances, um, and I won't take up too much time getting into the, the weeds of this, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have um, about each one of these. You can see that the largest, so in total, we have $56.7 million in outstanding debt related to the garages that is accounted for. The annual debt service is paid by the enterprise fund. Um, the largest component of that is for the construction of the HCID garage. Um, there's $5.3 million remaining on the, uh, the bonds that were sold to finance the repairs of the Roy and Lower Locks garage. We still have $11 million remaining uh, related to the construction of the early garage. Um, and then just recently, we issued $5 million for the, uh, the repair of the two garages, A. and Downs, as well as $1.4 million of the loan order that was issued to purchase new kiosks. Um, please, Mr. Ball. So to talk about the current rate structure, um, there is a chart on the screen that uh, kind of lays forward how many uh, pass cards are each at each product type, I'll call it. So of the approximately 4,000 total pass cards, 373 pass cards pay the full market rate. Um, and we have, you know, running down the list, about 1,800 that pay the group rate. Um, about 1,400 that pay the downtown resident rate, uh, and then about 316 in the category of uh, senior and disabled. So built the last time, and, and we went into this at the full council meeting, the last time a comprehensive rates uh, adjustment was considered by the city council was in 2017 approximately. Uh, as part of that amendment to the ordinance, and it's important to note that our parking fee structure is a function of city ordinance and so any any adjustment uh to these fees will require uh just like any other amendment to the ordinance a first reading a public hearing what we're doing here is just discussing the issues but it will it will need to come before the full city council for a first reading uh will need to get referred to a public hearing and then uh, will be considered by the council for a vote after a public hearing um, as part of the last one, a uh, consumer price index increase was built into the ordinance for the on-street and the, uh, the garage rates. Um, and as I mentioned, these are all creatures of ordinance. So please, Mr. Ball. By way of comparison, uh, the city of Lowell to the other larger cities in the Commonwealth, um, you know, there's, there's a chart here, and, and some of these, you know, to compare ourselves to Boston isn't necessarily a, a fair comparison, but, you know, it's $400 a month. Uh, any of us who have parked in Boston know um, how much that is or have, or have gone to visit. Uh, Springfield, there are a number of different garages, all of which run from $90 a month to $150 a month. Some are $100 a month. Um, the transient rate in the garages, so if you don't have a pass card but you just come to park, it's uh, $1.50 for the first half hour, $2 for each additional hour after that. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, there are different rate, um, monthly rate amounts during different types of, uh, excuse me, d different months of the year. 
Uh, and then on the transient rate, up to an hour is $4. From one to two hours is $6. Eight to nine hours is $22. And then over that, uh, from nine to 24 hours is, is $30. Uh, in Worcester, 24-7 um, access to the garages that are listed here is anywhere from $165 to the high range, $216. In the weekdays, it's a little bit less. Um, but for the sake of getting through this uh, presentation quickly, we'll move to the next slide, Mr. Ball. Um, so what we're bringing forward for consideration is amendments to the garage rates. So currently the market rate is $104. Um, written into the ordinance are discounts for these uh, different groups that I mentioned. 81% of the market rate is for the group rate. 75% of the market rate is the downtown resident rate. And then 41% of the market rate is for the downtown senior disabled rate. And on this chart, left to right, uh, at the bottom is a calculation of, at each interval, how much additional revenue that would bring to the enterprise fund. So at $125, it would generate an additional $776,000 a year. Uh, at $135, it'd be $1.14 million, $145, $1.59 million, and then at $175 a month, it would be $2.6 million for the enterprise fund. Mr. Ball. So the next part of the presentation and for consideration by the subcommittee and, and the council is the structure of the on-street operation. So what we do in Lowell is a flat fee across everywhere in the city, anywhere on the streets, it's the same fee. Uh, in 2021, um, the Department of Planning and Development contracted with a company called Stantec to do a, uh, a parking study which made a number of recommendations. One of the recommendations was to create availability uh, in the downtown parking through performance-based pricing. This is something that uh, other communities in Massachusetts and in New England uh, one that we've been talking about is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, they do in order to affect on-street availability of parking. And so you can see, the and this is a chart from the parking study itself, but different sections of the downtown on-street parking uh, are priced differently. And this is something we weren't available to even offer uh, with the old technology and the kiosk, but something that the new kiosk would allow us um, to do uh, if we are to amend the ordinance. And so, you know, the, the recommendation that came from Stantec was to, in that dark green area with the $3 signs, price that at a higher level than the dark, uh, I guess a lighter shade of green. Um, and then the, the furthest away from the core downtown would be the cheapest. So either we would not increase on-street parking there, um, or it, it could be a consideration for a reduction in the on-street rate in those areas. And the, the goal to, would be to price appropriately the parking that is in the highest demand. So, uh, next slide, Mr. Ball. Um, as for the discounts, um, one of the things that the council could consider, although it is, it is not in our recommendation here as it's presented, and, and we'll get to the final recommendations in a minute, would be to adjust or eliminate those discounts. And so the, the additional revenue uh, that would be generated if the rate were not adjusted, but only the discounts were adjusted, um, would be to generate an additional $268,000 in revenue. Um, if all of the rates, the market rate stayed at 104, the group rate stayed at 84, and the downtown rate, um, no, strike that. If the market rate stayed at 104, but the discounts were eliminated, that if 90%, and we've included a chart here. Uh, the resident rate. If we were to get rid of the resident Mi rate. Mr. Ryan, your microphone. The your microphone. Yeah. If we were to remove the resident rate, uh, yeah. as, as has been suggested, and we move that into a, the market rate, the higher rate, Looked at if 90% of the people converted, if 75% of the people converted, and if 50. If 90% of the people converted to the higher rate, we'd make, you know, we take in the 268. If at only 75, we would not make any more money. And if less than 50% of the people, we wouldn't. 
uh, we would actually lose money. So this was just an area that we looked at. Okay, so this is just one of the areas that we looked at to remove the resident rate as one of the scenario, just a scenario that we looked at. Sorry, just a, a quick question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, are we talking just the resident rate or are we talking, are we talking just the resident rate or are we talking all discounts? In, in this page, I just consider oh, on top of the yellow. It's, it's, it's just the looking at the rate. resident okay. rate, eliminating the resident rate and looking at how many people took advantage of the new, okay. the new plan. All right, okay. So basically the resident rate would, you know, if you're paying the resident rate now, it would go up, okay? Uh, and we understand that, you know, it was just a scenario that we looked at to make sure that we look at multiple scenarios of pricing. Just a quick question. I know we're going to open it up anyways, but did we look at like a tiered pricing in the garages like you're looking at for the parking meters, like ones that were in more demand? I know some of them were at 18% of their revenue projection. Some of them are at 40% of their, like more in line with where they should be for the year. Do we look about making, pe like if people are willing to walk a little further absolutely. away? Absolutely. That would be, absolutely be a consideration. We have the Lower Locks Garage, the AOC Garage, uh, and the Hamilton. If we can, if I could do something I would definitely do something to lure people into those garages. Uh, um, I, under consideration is also working with the courthouse to see if we can get the jury, jury members to park in that courthouse. So we are looking at, at a lot of different op options and talking about a lot of different options. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. When we talk about the um, dynamic pricing on street, have we looked at what other communities are doing and tried to come up with something where maybe our local businesses could validate and offer a, a discount rate if somebody's parking, visiting a local business, that way to, to kind of spur people to come in, spend money in the business in, in exchange, but those that are parking downtown and not visiting the businesses would be subject to a higher rate of parking. With the new kiosks, we can set up validations like that with you know a, a business could offer a discount they could provide their customer a discount number they could punch it into the the kiosk and we could offer a validation like that a cheaper rate there are multiple things that we can do well ha ha have, have you run any of these numbers potentially with validation included because now if you're gonna up the the parking in the Central downtown, I get it. I know that's prime real estate, but at the same time, if somebody's coming in and spending thirty, forty, fifty dollars in one of the local establishments for a lunch, that should have some weight to it because yeah, we're not getting on the parking, but it's in the local economy. So is that something also that you could run numbers as far as what kind of validation programs might look like within this? I I can look into that. I have not yet but I can look into that. Thank you. And continue, we're short on time. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief here because we have uh, Mr. Ryan, myself, the, the manager, and um, uh, we've met a number of times uh, about some options that are available and, and we want to put everything on the table um, and, and get the subcommittee's um, desire for, for what might work. Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump back, you know, this is driven primarily uh, financially, and if, if the enterprise fund becomes insolvent, um, any deficit in the enterprise fund will need to be raised on the tax rate in the subsequent year. That is a requirement um, of the general laws. This year, uh, the council took a vote to uh, appropriate from stabilization money into the parking enterprise fund. That will buy us some time, for sure. But it, it certainly buys us time to have this conversation, uh, to vet these kinds of options. But if no revenue enha enhancements are sought, uh, the enterprise fund will become insolvent. And so a number of other considerations outside of the adjustments to rates um, revolve around dynamic pricing, so offering event pricing during times with, that there are events at the Lowell Memorial Auditorium, uh, the Songus Center, et cetera. Um, 
you know, I'll just run, you know, electric vehicle charging. Uh, we do not currently charge for the electricity at the charging stations. Um, so, but in order to do so, we would need to bring an amendment to the ordinance. That is something uh, we're going to look to do. Um, as well as long-term car storage options uh, and increased violation fees. So one of the, Mr. the ball? Okay. Um, you know, one of the other considerations, if we are to make these substantial uh, adjustments to dynamic pricing or to some of the times uh, of the enforcement, we're going to need staff to enforce it. And so I, I won't get into too much detail about uh, about this, but the current staff, um, it, it just outlines the number of enforcement officers we have. Um, we're, we're likely going to need to look at the budget for the parking department if we're going to have to enforce uh, in outside hours on the weekends or late at night if we're going to make some changes to the on-street parking. So uh, finally, uh, and we'll, we'll end here, our recommendations as they stand now are to amend the garage rate to at least $135 a month. Uh, for the market rate and maintain all of the discounts um, for all of the downtown residents, uh, the senior, disabled, et cetera, uh, to amend the ordinance to allow for dynamic pricing. That is something that we would work with uh, the law department to bring changes to the ordinance, um, to afford the city the opportunity uh, to do some of these things with the kiosks that they, they will allow us to do. Uh, to adjust the, adjust the enforcement hours on street from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., uh, to amend the violations, so these would be for meter violations, et cetera, by $5, uh, make amendments to permits. We didn't get into this. We didn't have time, but can at a future meeting, uh, some of the recommendations from the parking department relative to permitting, um, as well as some other miscellaneous enhancements that we didn't necessarily have time for. So thank you very much for the time. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that the subcommittee has. That's all right. Yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah. Okay, I'd just like to open it up to the public if anyone would like to speak. Yeah. I'm sorry? If you could just state your name and address. Uh, Peter Richards, 130 John Street. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Council Gitchia, Council Robinson. Um, I guess what I'd like to do, and I, Mr. Baldwin is working in these proposals, Mr. Ryan, uh, kind of from a math problem, and I think you all need to. St I think we need to step back. One of the things you need to do is to take a look at the parking in reference to the kind of downtown you envision, what you want the downtown to be. Um, I can do a little bit of history. Um, in the late 70s and early 80s, as we were becoming a national park town. There was a significant amount of renovation occurring in the downtown, and primarily that was producing senior housing because that's where the incentives were. As a result of which, we have a significant senior population in the downtown, and that's to do that. We then, you know, not to set time frames on it, but we went through a phase where we were going to try and be art, you know, art driven, the artist lofts, together with the university driven, college driven kind of community. The idea was then to change the parking rate to set aside some of those carve outs that would make it easier for that to happen. And I understand that. See, all of these carve outs have a reason that they came into existence that can be tied to what a vision of the city's downtown was. Um, we obviously wanted to create an opportunity as a lot of the housing came on, and I'm one of those people. I started over in Centerville, I downsized and um, moved down, I'm now on John Street. Um, we tried to make it attractive for those people who live downtown to move there. We also tried to have some of these carve outs for the group rates to encourage businesses to relocate here so that they would, in addition to the downtown residents, be supportive of our downtown businesses. So really that vision piece is important. I, I understand that if we raise the rates and put everybody on the same rate, we are going to generate more money, which is going to then respond to the deficit which I understand, it's, that's an issue, I got that. Uh, but that's just a math problem, and that doesn't take into account the reality of the downtown that you'd like it to be, whatever that happens to be. And that's a discussion that takes place at the council level. The fact of the matter is that these car votes are there, they were done for a reason, and do we want to eliminate them, which is gonna have an impact? Look, uh, I saw business owners, and I don't speak to being a business owner, I'm not. 
Uh, my guess is business owners would like a lot of available parking, as cheap as they could get it, to get the people in the door. Got it. The fact of the matter is, though, too, that the downtown businesses, and look, I'm not telling anybody in this room anything. If you walk downtown Lowell, there are a lot of empty storefronts, more than any of us would like. There are businesses down there, and I think what we'd like to do is to try and see them survive and encourage others to come in. In order to do that, what we have to account for is what's going to sustain them. Now, Councillor Robinson may reference people come in on the dynamic parking on the street, bring them in, uh, maybe validate parking, that's one of the things to do. But, and, and look, Lowell is really good at putting together events with Lowell Folk Festival, a variety of interests, which generates traffic, which helps those businesses. But the bottom line, I think, and I'm not a business owner, so I can't speak to this definitively, but the bottom line is those business owners survive on the day-to-day -day business generated by downtown residents and people who work in the city. So when you start affecting the rates, whether they be on street or, as it is in my case, um, the downtown parking garages, and I've now advanced into the situation, I guess a lot of people here in Lowell, I'm now a senior citizen on a fixed income, um, it's real. And so if you're talking about the kind of increases you're talking about, that has a material effect. It has a material effect on a great number of the people who live in the city who use those facilities. And even for some of those market rate folks who can afford it, look, I bought a condominium at market rate, but uh, I'm on a fixed income and now my budget is such that you talk about doubling my parking rate. There are issues there. So I think that needs to be considered. The other point, Ms. Baldwin, to speak to your point about the uh, enterprise fund and needing to be f solvent, I understand that. But I can speak, uh, I can't speak to the current budget. You'll forgive me, I haven't done those. But I took a look at some city budgets in, pretty de in some depth a long time ago. And we regularly subsidized the Lowell Memorial Auditorium to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars because it was determined that the auditorium was an important part of the downtown and was a necessary feature and was worth the money that we were spending to keep it functioning as an entity. I would argue that the parking garages can fit that same thing if it comes down to it, which is not to say we can't adjust the rates, but a subsidy of the, of the parking garages, a subsidy of the parking enterprise fund, strike me as being not entirely outrageous because there's certainly a precedent for having done that in the past. And maybe we still do it, I don't know, as I said, I haven't looked at the city budget um, as far as that goes. Um, one last point uh, to speak to, and that would be, I know that some of the discussion at the council level batted around, and maybe or maybe not, is the privatization of the garages. And I guess I would only urge that not to be a factor. In one way, yeah, it takes the problem off the hands and you generate a significant sum from selling the assets. But the fact that you own those parking garages, the city owns those parking garages, allows them to be in charge of what I, just, what I started with, which is you can shape the vision because you've got a tool to do it, as all of those car votes would seem to indicate that we were trying to shape a vision. Now, maybe they haven't worked out as well as you want, and I understand that we're in a problem, but I think the council, the subcommittee and the council as a whole needs to step back and really take a look at that vision piece and decide whether or not by solving an initial, we, holy crap, we've got a problem, we need to generate more money, and let's take a long view here and let's see the best way to manage parking and put the whole thing together. So I guess, I'm sorry they're a little long, but um, I got a little history here uh, and I have some perspective and I think the council needs to take a look at the big picture. So I'd urge you to do that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? State your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Craig Faulkner, 200 Market Street. I'm also the owner of Warp and Weft. So I can actually speak to this from a resident perspective and from a business owner. Um, as, as a resident, I mean, you, you pretty much said everything that I needed to say. But as a business owner, I can tell you that it's really, really difficult for us to make ends meet every single day. If you come into my restaurant, it may be packed more often than not, and I struggle every single week to pay the bills. If we are taking, if we are doubling the cost of parking for the residents who are 90% of my customers, their discretionary income is mostly gone. And so is my business. And we have another empty storefront downtown. I think that we need to do as a city a better job of bringing businesses into town before we start thinking of raising rates for parking because we need to attract people to want to park here. And we're not doing a great job at that right now. So. Thank you for everything you said. I appreciate it. You took a lot of my time away. Thank you all so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Please. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and Councilors. Uh, my name is Robert Casey. I'm at 58 Prescott Street, a relative uh, newcomer to Lowell um, in terms of living here anyway. But um, <clears throat> I agree with everything I've heard. However, um, I, think, I think it would be good to take everyone to take a step back and ask ourselves, how did we get into this problem? And in my mind, from what I've seen in five years, Lowell is garage crazy. Um, I have no idea why the, the most recent garage that opened in the Hamilton Canal District is there, based on the fact that there doesn't seem to be anyone parking in it. And then it really, it actually really disturbs, almost breaks my heart when I watch that new garage go up right in front of this gorgeous new courthouse building. And when I read in the newspaper uh, and other media some of the history of that parking garage and um, aside from the fact it's an eyesore um, and the, it, it just really boggles my mind. So basically the city has created a glut of parking through I would say either no planning or poor planning or chicken before the egg type stuff, I, I don't know. So now it looks like we have a glut of parking so the reaction is <coughs> that we're going to have to ask the residents and business owners to, uh, to close the gap because of these, um, of these really serious errors. Uh, I, I have no idea why we have all these garages in Lowell. Um, the other thing, too, is it bothers me about all this discussion. Um, is it, I, don't think any, I don't hear anyone even giving any thought to uh, transit, to public transit. Um, you know, the new courthouse, Again, I love the building. I walk by it all the time. I probably have 200 photographs of it. It sits right across the street from a transit center, a train service that cuts right through Middlesex County from Somerville to Lowell. Uh, you know, there's no articulation between that, that new entity and the public transit. And even to me, the attitude in the room tonight is, well, the only way people are coming into Lowell, or using Lowell, is if they come in a car. And I think that is, um, that's like so 1960, 1970 maybe. So I think we, we have a big problem with how we got here. And if we don't address that, I think we're just in for more problems. As far as closing this gap goes, again, I think it's unfair to put it on the, the backs of the residents downtown. I think it's a citywide problem. Uh, maybe you have to uh, maybe you have to eliminate your uh, enterprise fund. I understand why we have them and they make sense, but you know this this right now is really a boondoggle as far as uh, expecting any enterprise fund to cover to cover the costs of the, uh, these garages. So I do think there should be some modest increases in the rates for the garages. Um, I do think you've got to get your meters working and uh, and adjust those rates. But you're not going to close that gap with those types of things and putting the whole thing on the backs of the taxpayers and residents downtown is a, is a mistake. So thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hi, I'm Karen Frederick. I'm the CEO at Community Teamwork, uh, the seventh largest employer in the city. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. This is Lisa Hooley, our HR director. She's got the numbers. Um, but I just wanted to say, I know you have difficult decisions to make, and I respectfully ask that you consider uh, some of the things that we say tonight in your decision making. Um, 200 of our employees are in the center downtown area at Children's Village at the Mill on Market Street, at our Youth Center on um, Dutton Street, at our headquarters, and on Kirk Street where our WIC and um, uh, fuel assistance program is. So there's a lot of us down here. We don't want our staff parking on the street. We know that takes away uh, from businesses. And I also know that when rates go up, that's what they do. They take their chances and go park on the street. And that is certainly not our intent. Currently, we do enjoy, uh, as a member of the chamber, the discount. Um, and we also, community teamwork covers 50% of the parking costs for our staff, except for our management staff who pay 100% of, of the discounted rate on their own. 
So we do look to help our staff who need the help the most. We also um, encourage staff to come work for us who have been clients. We have many people who work their way up through the organization and they're not making a lot of money. And any, any increase is a significant impact on their lives and on their budgets. So um, we also wanna keep people you know, working and coming into the city and Lisa can tell you a little more about our challenges there. Um, but we truly appreciate your thoughts. And on behalf of the clients, many of our low-income seniors live downtown, and it definitely, uh, any increase is a hardship for all of them, we know that. So thank you, and Lisa can tell you some of our numbers. Thank you. Thank you, so as Karen said, we have over 500 employees across Lowell. Um, we have 200 employees in, in the downtown area, and 123 of those have chosen to park in the parking garages. And we subsidize 111 of their parking, um, 111 employees. So we pay $44 a month for those folks and the managers pay $88 a month. Um, and that might not sound like a huge number, but to some of our employees who are just above minimum wage, it really is difficult for them to make those payments. Um, and as an HR professional trying to recruit folks, it is challenging, you know, every, any, every penny counts, especially when we're making offers to folks that are just above minimum wage. So um, just ask you to consider that because it, it does add an additional challenge to our, to our work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? Would anyone else like to speak? My name is Steve Severson. I live on Dutton Street, and I'm also a, a businessman. I have uh, Van Gogh's Gear Art Supplies on Market Street. The, uh, my customer base is always searching for a parking space, and the common problem that I have is not only finding a space, which is typical, but also they come to my store and say, I can't get any of the meters to work. Okay, and you're talking about bringing in new meters, and my first question is, how good are they going to be? These meters are currently sitting out here for the past five years and five? Fifteen. No. Twelve to fifteen. The kiosks that are out there now? Twelve to fifteen years. No way. I disagree. <laughs> anyway, however long they've been there, they don't work. Um, and it requires people to either ignore them take the chances of getting a ticket and then having to go fight that, um, which is now an online process, as I understand it. Uh, so that's one of the problems. The second is, um, I'm a senior citizen. I park in the Leo Roy garage um, and quietly accepted the $43 rate that was just Im imposed. Um, but to accept yet another rate increase seems completely unreasonable. Um, and in the whole presentation, I didn't hear any conversation about what can be done about reducing expenses. Are we paying LAS too much money for not doing any work, for example? Um, we have, the, there was a commitment by LAS and other, whoever was before them, uh, to provide multiple people in each garage, one for security to drive around and make sure everything was safe, and another to run the, the uh, keep the booth uh, managed at the gate. Um, if you go to the Leo Roy garage today, you will never see a human, okay? Unless you make a phone call from the gate and they show up out of the back room or side room that's on the left if you're looking at the building. Uh, they're not in the glassed office space and they're not in the, in the uh, uh, cubicle. All right, and there's only one answering the phone if, you, if there's a problem at the gate he comes out of that side room. So there is no uh, golf cart with a security guy running around checking, make sure everything's okay anymore. Uh, there used to be an option, if you didn't feel uh, comfortable walking to your car, you could get a ride to your car or a set an escort to your car from one of the uh, parking attendants, okay? That's not there anymore. Um, so. Things keep degrading in these garages, two or three of which we don't need at this moment. 
yet we want to increase the price. Okay, it does. There's a dichotomy going on here. Um, we're not getting we're not getting what we're paying for now, and we're going to pay more for it. Thank you. Thank you. One more speaker. We ha we do have another meeting at six thirty, so we'll probably have to continue because there's so many speakers here. But um, if you'd like to finish up, if you would like to speak, that would be great. Thank you. Well, um, I, my name is Sally Coulter. I live at Canal Place One, Two Hundred Market Street, and thank you for letting me speak. Um, I, just two things I've heard tonight that I liked: Corey Robinson's idea about um, giving discounts but I would say if businesses give a discount they'd only do it if they get so much you know fifteen dollars you know in in merchandise from the from the person so I don't know what the number would be but something like that I also like the idea of trying to get people from the jury pools from the it's really very sad to have a private developer making money you know next door to that very nice Justice Center uh, while we can't fill the Hamilton garage. But downtown residents already pay more and get less for services. So eliminating all discounts for parking garages I think is a mistake. You can apply for a parking sticker to park in the area where they live. In addition, residents can ask for a resident parking sign in front of their residence. This annual pass costs $10 a year, or 80.4 cents per month. Downtown residents pay for garage parking, which is $78 a month, or $43 if you're a senior or you're, dis or you're disabled. In addition, other parts of the city have garbage and, and recycling collections included in their taxes. Downtown residents pay taxes, but if you live in a condo, you end up paying HOA fees because you don't get your garbage collected or recycled collected. So let's review that. In the other parts of the city, the stickers are free. The parking sign, if you ask for one, is 80.4 cents per month. And downtown resident parking garages is $43 if you're a senior or disabled and $78 if you're a resident otherwise. The downtown includes a variety of residents, young professionals, handicapped, low income, and re retired folks. It behooves the city to keep these residents in the downtown, making it a more vibrant place. Senior residents frequently volunteer for nonprofits, from memberships on boards, to hours working for places like Living Waters, the Bike Connection, Canal Cleaners, many others. In addition, Representative Van Howard has created a downtown street cleaning crew. Most of these folks are senior citizens who have an area or street where they pick up trash once a week. And it's been very effective. I think Jack Moynihan is one of the instrumental people in that. Upping parking rates and eliminating nighttime parking on the streets is a disincentive to living downtown, an area which I said earlier already pays more taxes for less services. I understand the difficulty of balancing budgets but feel they shouldn't be balanced disproportionately on the backs of downtown residents. I would suggest a more modest increase in general parking, garage parking, with a commensurate increase in the parking fees in other parts of the city as well as an increase in the street meter parking that is higher on an hourly basis than the garage. Um, Laura Anderson at our downtown meeting talked about trying to get people to, um, it would be more expensive if you're just going to be there for a, an hour or so and try to get people into the garages, make it an incentive so that it's less than whatever the hourly rate is. And finally, Sal Lapoli's garage next to the courthouse comes online. Make parking in the Hamilton garage cheaper if you can't get a bunch of people from the, the courthouse to park there. Hopefully the 
The council and manager will scrutinize any deals with developers in the future to be more advantageous to the city and its residents. Make no mistake, I live downtown and I love it, but I'm hoping that you don't do something that'll drive people out. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we are able to continue the meeting. I thought there was a group coming in. They moved to the other chamber. Um, so if anyone else would like to speak, you're welcome to. Any other speakers? Uh, my name is Ted Labash. I live at Aero Lobs on Middle Street, and I'm retired and live in a fixed income. And believe me, when the garage costs go up, my fixed income goes down. So uh, I don't like to see the increase at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Hi, I'm Felice Kincannon. I live in Ted's building at 172 Middle, Middle Street. Um, I think probably three points. First is, th this should have been glaringly obvious, this deficit, for quite some time. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry that it was let go until it became such a serious issue. Second point is, I think everybody who spoke previously made great points about the need for a holistic perspective. Lowell has a tendency to do, okay, there's a point solution and there's a point solution and there's a point, point solution without taking the time to appreciate that those point solutions may have ramifications for other issues that arise in the city. And the last thing I'll say is I'm gonna be a little chauvinistic here because I am um, an older downtown resident Downtown has the third lowest income across the city, third lowest household income. And I don't know what the number of renters is, but it's pretty significant. Over 60% of those renters pay more than the commonly accepted 30% of their income. So the impact for this on downtown, the, the proposed increase on downtown residents would be really significant, as other people have said. And I hope that there's a more creative solution to what is an obvious problem. There's no question about the fact that we've got a problem. But just going all at once, I'm, I'm not sure is quite the right approach to take. Thanks. Thank you. So anyone else that would like to speak? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson and, and Councilors. Uh, I'm Jack Moynihan. I live at 88 uh, Prescott Street, and I'm also co-chair of the uh, Lowell Downtown Neighborhood Association. And I want to thank all the people who came out here tonight to, uh, to speak. I must say, I, I, I'm not going to really add much here. I just wanted to uh, emphasize a couple of points that were made. But I, I will say that I'm, after hearing uh, Mr. Baldwin, I'm less fired up than uh, that I was before coming here, because it sounds like it isn't entirely a done deal. But, and, and that uh, eliminating the, uh, the discounts is not, uh, is not already decided. Because as other people have said, I mean, it, it would be a, a severe impact on a lot of people who, it, particularly the uh, low-income people who live and work in the downtown. But even other, with other people, as particularly Mr. Martin and, uh, and Craig Faulkner said, I mean, any, uh, any changes in that, that affect the other residents of downtown and the, uh, their income has a, uh, have, would have a significant in <laughs> impact on, uh, on businesses here. So anything that makes it less attractive for people to live or buy, own businesses or work in the downtown is a detriment to, uh, detriment to, the, to the city and the downtown. Uh, I think now Mr. Martin mentioned the idea of if you had to do a, a subsidy, it might be worthwhile. I mean, I think that uh, that the garages are a really big resource for the uh, the city. The, we, most people try to promote the city as a tourist uh, location. We have uh, a couple of really big uh, big festivals and the, uh, the the folk festival and uh, and uh, also the uh, kinetic sculpture race and. 
other race, other uh, things are being promoted now by uh, Mosaic. So where are people going to park? If you want to attract more people to the uh, to the downtown, or the, just the city in general, they're going to have to park in garages. So it shouldn't be. So any uh, any increases shouldn't be entirely borne by uh, just by the uh, by the fa nameless, faceless uh, monthly uh, pass holders, because uh, most of us are, are taxpayers. Uh, as well. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for, for your time, and thanks for the uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. I believe at this point, Council Janess. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, first, thank you to so many of my neighbors who came out tonight to to talk on this important issue that affects everyone who almost everyone who lives downtown and many people who work and visit the downtown um, there's a lot of good information in this and I think that I'm gl I'm really glad for the presentation that the CFO put forward um, because coming in here I, I wasn't sure what we we're gonna see tonight and this is better than what I was expecting so um, as Jack said, I, I'm not as fired up either, but I still think there are some important considerations that we all need to take into, um, into account before we make any changes here. Um, I looked at some of the census data for downtown. Um, there's two census tracts that really cover all downtown and the areas for which the garages are in. Um, 3101.02 is the core of the downtown. There are about 2,900 people who live in 0.2 square miles. Um, the median household income of this area is $43,621. 64% of the households uh, in this census tract have household income of less than $50,000 a year. Um, about 26.3% of the folks who live downtown in the census tract live below the poverty line. That's one and a half times the rate in all of Lowell. 40% of the children under 18 in this area live below the poverty line. 83% of the units are renter occupied. There is a 99% occupancy rate for all residential units in this area, which makes me want to mention that we didn't talk about, we talked about raising revenue from the existing customer base. We haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about increasing that customer base. With a 99% <laughs> occupancy rate, it's clear that people want to live downtown. People enjoy living downtown. We've created a product that people want to spend their time and money embracing. So I think that looking at ways to increase the opportunities for folks to live downtown is an important way to address this shortfall in addition to looking at raising funds. There are many good points made by many of the speakers and I won't go over them again. Um, but one thing I will mention is trash came up, the idea of trash removal. And this is something that in other areas of the city, people have curbside pickup. It's also very similar in parking in the sense that it's funded both by a user fee, a combination of a user fee, which every household that has curbside trash pays, as well as taxpayer dollars from the general fund. Um, that is a very similar structure to currently what we're looking at with the parking. And I think it's important to note that uh, those two, there's very little overlap. The people who park in the garage as residents are the ones who don't get trash pickup and vice versa. So if we're looking at the subsidy that we're attributing to a household from the general fund, it's important to look at both sides of that coin. Um, there's many more, more things I'd like to say, but I won't wanna, don't want to keep people here longer, and I know this is not the last time we're going to be talking about this. So thank you very much for your time, and I, once again, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight and, uh, and sharing their thoughts. Thank you. And Council Robinson. Thank you. Um, I think this discussion needs to be continued. I think... Uh, the subcommittee and, and the administration needs and the residents need to continue this conversation. I'm glad people realize we're nowhere near a done deal on, on the increase or elimination of, of any of these rates. Um, I think some of the things we need to really look at, and, and we've brought this forward, is potentially marketing strategy using the garages income put into the account to help offset with some how much that is we don't know but 
that's things I think we need to on the miscellaneous enhancements. Another potential opportunity I think is permitting the rooftops of these garages for for venues again to generate additional income for the the facilities themselves. Um, and I'd like to make a motion just just for information. Do you think before we meet again we could possibly get um, the motion would be to provide a report on what would be required just for the city to take back full operation of the garages in house as opposed to what we're paying out in contractors just just for a, a comparison on price to see is there any savings to be made there I mean it's worth exploring before we go and adjust any rates I think we need to have all this information before us to make an informed decision and um, another question I'd have and, and maybe someone from the public could answer do any of the HOA fees downtown include parking spots? Does anyone know that? Yes, yes I, I can answer that a little bit. Each condo association is a little different depending on when it was built and what the arrangements were. Um, for example, my building, I live Canal Place 1, 200 Market Street. Uh, our parking is such that we have actually have a garage under the building that includes a small amount of spaces, not near enough for the building. And there's a surface lot that has more. Then uh, most of us, or a lot of us, park in the Roy garage. Our condo fee covers one parking space. That parking space is either in the surface lot or in the Roy garage. Anything more than that, we, we pay the resident rate on our own. Um, other buildings do it differently, but that's, that's one setup. So there are places that do include it. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I, I mean, so there's a motion on the floor right now. I don't know if I can get a second. Second. Just, just for information purposes. Um, w the motion is to provide a report on what would be required to take back full operation of garages in-house, including pricing, just for comparison purposes. Okay, I'll second the motion. All in favor? We don't need a roll call, right? Okay, I so that passes. And, and I'd like to thank the speakers for all coming out, and I'd like to thank the administration. And, and, and again, I mean, uh, I think it's been a great conversation. I think we can find that middle ground and, and, and a way to get over this <laughs> significant hurdle. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I'd also just like to thank everyone for coming out. We're going to continue the meeting. Um, and thank you. I think what we all heard was that we need a holistic approach just to put everything on the table and look to see what we can do. We're definitely in a deficit. We haven't had an increase in, in the garage rate in quite a long time. Um, but we definitely want to look at everything and see what we can do. So, uh, Councilor Gitchia. You know, <clears throat> when, when you look at a lot of the pieces in place, you have to look at government itself and say, are we efficient or are we not? We're looking at all of the garages as one, which makes no sense to me at all. It should be broken into the pieces and the revenue pieces come from each one. If you looked at Warren Street, we all should have known that on Heard Street there's this thing that was called the courthouse. It was going to leave and the revenues were going to take a dip. Yet we put the money down into the um, HCID and we spent $33 million, and for a cutback of $160,000 in revenue. And there may be future revenue there, or whatever it is. But at the same time, we came in as a government and said to a private builder, we're going to give you a million dollar tiff to build next to us and be our competitor. Now, does that make a lot of sense to anybody in the room? Well, he wants more, or they want more and more and more. And now the manager's office has to deal with these things going forward. And, and I understand what former Councilor Richards is saying about trying to generate, but at some point it generated to a major, major negative. Right now, that garage, as we looked at the pieces, that one's taking in a deficit of $2 million a year. 2.5 out of the three that we're even looking at is coming right from there. One garage. The Hamilton Canal. One garage. You're getting $160,000 in revenue projections right now on a $2.67 million note that you're paying on the other side. So right then and there, you already lost. And then we go down to the Warren Street garage and we look and say, okay, let's see how smart we were at the time. And we said, we're going to move the courthouse down here. 
but we have a garage down here that we have debt of five million dollars right now on five million dollars in debt UMass Lowell uses it Middlesex uses it and I don't know the terms with them I, I, would, I would defer to the CFO to bring that back to us in a report later on the terms of, of these long-term deals and what they are to these entities but why not look at selling that garage to them let's do a hybrid model we don't have to sell all of them we don't have to privatize all of them let's look at the ones that make sense if they're gonna use it and they're the majority user why shouldn't they pay I, I don't know when, when you start looking at the numbers and you start looking at deficits spending versus projections you quickly find out that the Middlesex Street garage is the only one that's actually meeting the projections that were there and it's in it's barely over but it is can we increase there just a little bit to offset the Market Street garage or another garage where we have more residential there so a hybrid model needs to be put in place and when you look at performance based pricing that's what most people do if you go to Worcester it's performance based you're like okay here it is DCU event this we look at UMass Lowell over here at um, the high school the high school pricing over there per month is thirty dollars a little bit over everywhere else it's forty three right mm -hmm. why why don't we just give that discount to the students in the faculty and everyone else here it is it's forty three sorry I think that if you're going to be an efficient government you have to break it into the pie and start looking on street parking I understand on street parking but if we have a garage right across the street why not increase the on street parking amount and push people to the garage and if you want the on street parking it's just like down in front of the courthouse if you want to park close park close to the private guy and pay more that's your that's your prerogative but there is an option to go down the street and pay a little bit less and walk the four minutes or, or whatever it was said you have to look at this government is always in a rush to solve the problem because we don't have a lot of time we understaff and then we try to push these major problems on to a CFO and his department who is you know riddled with everything we have three enterprise funds not one all three are going to the negative what does that tell you and if you're going to look at rates it has to be performance based and we should be looking at it on a yearly basis so we can say okay we're off this much let's increase the water by 15 cents rather than all at once six dollars that's what communities do they look at okay small time increases are we running efficient at the time and when you talk about the water industry and you look at what is the driver a lot of it is unaccounted for water and maintenance issues the market street uh, parking garage the Roy Street as uh, Councilor Jeunesse referred to has zero debt right now zero debt why should that garage have to pay for the one that's down on Warren Street I don't know and if, and if you're gonna look at that and you're gonna look at money and say okay how do we put it into an account so that we can save a little bit maybe charge a little bit so you're a little bit over on your projections so that you can save so the future you can have expendable money to offset the debt to each piece then it would make sense but this whole pie of giving people long-term rentals and saying that that's what it is because that's the way it's been done is is killing this city it's choking it we can't keep just going up on everybody's taxes without doing the homework first you have to be an efficient government in order to ask somebody for more money and in my opinion when you start looking at performance based pricing and you start looking at it as a whole and you cut it into the pie and say okay how is this garage actually working what is the point to it I, I think you'll quickly see that some of them even in the COVID time that they're saying are still not far off from projections the Dutton Street is minus five from the projection but that doesn't even come near the debt cost but then you look at Middlesex Street it's right there the Davison Street is six percent under which is not a lot to pick up and when you start looking at all of them through you'll start to quickly see that the debt that is being put on everybody across is not fair because you're not the user of that garage or that area so it should be broken into pieces we have departments that are broken up into different sections and they say hey 
Belvedere's rentals cost more than it does for the acre to rental. Why should the acre have to be charged the same price as Belvedere? There are going to be garages that are going to be just high use end that should have a price set, and then it should also fall the other way downhill as you start going out, as it was presented by uh, CFO Baldwin in his on-street parking piece. On-street parking we looked at in a broad, with a broad paintbrush and said, over here, not so much, over here, yes. Why can't we look at all the garages that way and say the same thing? And then look at them also. Is it a residential user? Is it a business user? Or is it some other function that it's used for? And can it be into a hybrid model? As Council Robinson had said in the past, can it be sold off in not have that great of effect? And, and I think the Warren Street garage is one of those that you could look at as long as the long-term pieces, and maybe they can be factored in, but you got $5 million in debt that comes out of that garage, and it's for community college in a um, full-time university and the problem is their rates on the students are not down because they get cheaper parking one of them I think it was UMass Lowell I, I ran their numbers and um, as I started to run them I think it's four hundred fifty dollars for the full year for a student to park in their beautiful garages and that's 10 months, so it's $45 a month for them to park in those garages. Maybe we need to go over and see them on how they built all these garages and gutted it. $45 to park over there. I don't know the answer, but um, and maybe they're willing to take on that piece down there because they have an in-conference center right there, and it just makes a lot of sense. And, and I mean, I look forward to future conversations on this because... I spent hours looking at it just um, wondering how did we get to the place we're at. And I don't have the privy to all the agreements that are signed on, you know, what does this one get, what does that one get, how long are the agreements. And, and I think they were probably set in place long before you guys. And they're continually long, long, and that's bad for any community. Yeah, and, and that's the sad part. So maybe we need to get back in there and start to try to renegotiate those terms and see if that something can be worked out because it isn't really fair to people who are not using it to pay for people to come in here and drive to another community right after. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gitchia. Um, at this point in time, I think we should probably continue the, the meeting to another date. Um, we'll schedule another meeting. Um, we can have more discussion around the performance-based model in general with the garages and the street parking um, also we haven't even had a discussion about the residential parking placards the sticker program all of those things that we kind of have to look at as the whole picture um, in making up for this deficit um, so i would make a motion i guess to adjourn at this point in time second second, second meeting adjourned mm -hmm. <laughs>